Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. Uh, today I wanted to talk about the non-fiction shortlist for the Rathbones Prize. Um, and so I mentioned in the previous um, uh, in the previous video about the fiction shortlist that there's been a change where the, the Rathbones Prize previously had non-fiction, fiction, poetry, um, all in one category. And now it's separated out into three separate ones. And I think what's really exciting about that for this year especially has been that this has allowed five really exciting and interesting books to thrive. Um, and I think this is a very strong shortlist of non-fiction books um, that all really take the idea of what non-fiction can do and play with it and do new things and find new angles to do this with. So with all that said, let's get involved and let's let's kind of start looking at the shortlist itself. First up, we have The Passengers by Will Ashen. And this is a book that I think was just so interesting in, in many, many ways. Um, it essentially takes as its central premise this idea of asking random people to to sort of share stories about things that have happened to them. And sometimes those stories are funny and light and interesting and, and what have you. Sometimes they're incredibly deep and uh, they, you know, people open up and tell you their darkest secrets. And sometimes really as well, this is uh, a way that some people just share little moments from their life that have they've maybe been stuck with them for a while that they've been really thinking about. So for example, we get these really detailed conversations in here, often about things like mental health, um, about loss and grief, um, about sort of their day-to-day -day fears, all of these little things that come up. And I think this is where this book has its, uh, how this book is most successful because it goes beyond just feeling like a curated set of stories. It doesn't feel just like, cool, here are 170 or whatever it is, excerpts from people in public. There's a sort of either a theming kind of happening or there's a way that these people have been made to feel comfortable enough to share that allows them to take on this kind of multi-voiced kind of feeling where the, the whole book feels like it is these stories kind of weaving and washing over you of of people saying everything. And kind of as a result, by the end of the book, you get this full and complete picture almost of what a group of people, this sort of very big snapshot essentially of a group of people have been thinking about things. And as a result, it feels just very real. I listened to the audiobook of this and there was something quite interesting about letting all of that wash over you. Um, like I said, it's about 180 chapters, I think overall. So about 170-ish stories um and uh you know these various bits and th there's a part towards the end for example where there are a couple left blank um and it ends on this really poignant note from that there's a there's a real curation that's gone on to to make this order work and to to tie these together so neatly um that i just found really engaging i think it's a very exciting book um and and one that doesn't at first sound like it would be the most exciting thing, right? To to say, oh, I've just got some snapshots of things that people wanted to tell me that they've maybe never told anyone before. And, you know, some of those might involve somebody telling you about the time that they um, they fell off a bike or somebody might be telling you about Alzheimer's or depression um, and somebody else might be telling you about a shop they really like. You know, it, it doesn't sound like it should work. And I kind of love that it does work. I think it's a really clever and heartfelt book. Um, and I really commend the author in how this had been put together. Next up, we have In Love by Amy Bloom. Um, and this is, uh, you know, a, a fairly, a, a bit more of a standard, quote unquote, memoir, uh, but a really poignant one, nonetheless. It's about uh, essentially finding, uh, what is going on with this light? My God. Uh, it is about essentially Amy Bloom taking her husband to Switzerland and this sort of final journey they make because he is going to uh, have his life um, sort of ended um, as part of, a, you know, basically self-euthanasia or euthanasia through the Dignitas Clinic in Switzerland, uh, which is a famous clinic for offering that as one of the first um, and sort of definitely still one of the most prominent. And the sort of the the springboard for a lot of that, it was uh, Amy Bloom's husband starting to um, show the first signs of Alzheimer's. And he particularly was very worried about not being able to remember things, but also he wants to sort of end on this high. He wants to end while he remembers things in his life. He wants Amy 
to be able to um, see the end of the relationship and then to end on this high note and then her not to feel that the last 15, 20 years of their relationship are her caring for him um, or her kind of feeling some kind of resentment or, or what have you. They, they have these very frank conversations between them and he's made up his mind that is what he wants to do. She is there to support him. And so essentially, you know, a good bit of this book is them going to Switzerland and them having their final moments together. And really not that much of the book really in, in, in general sense is about this, the moment just after, but the bits we do get of just after are so deeply poignant um, and really beautifully told, I think. This book doesn't linger in a sort of sentimentalism of just kind of, this is not a book of Amy Bloom spending 200 pages just talking about how sad she is essentially, even though she'd be very justified in writing that book. This is a book about practical decisions and about the value of a relationship and the value of memories and understanding what they had together and how beautiful it had been. And so in many ways, the title of this book is a very appropriate one. This book is about love, um, even though what happens in this book feels like the the saddest end of a relationship. Um, it's done in such a poignant way. And I think this is a, a gorgeous, gorgeous memoir. Next up, uh, we have a very different book indeed, and that's Jonathan Friedland's The Escape Artist. Um, and this is a, um, a book that goes into the life of Walter Rosenberg, um, a man who escaped Auschwitz and basically went on to, to tell the world about what was going on. It's a really cleverly done book, I think. It, um, I sort of said in a weekly roundup recently that this book reads kind of like a novel in some ways. There's a real narrative propulsion to this book. It's um, and you know the the author did a lot of research that involved sort of storytelling and hearing people's stories about this man. And in so doing, uh, I think it sort of picked up this this real narrative thread that runs through the book of it really feeling like a a novel. And the scary thing with this book is often being reminded that it's not a novel and that these things very much happened. Um, they were very real and utterly terrifying. And the the fact that this is still, you know, there are still people living who would have experienced some aspect of it, either being in the camps themselves or were sort of in the periphery or knew someone. And it's a really heartbreaking book in many, many ways. But the narrative that is told really is a is a fascinating one we get this this character walter who is fascinating he has this interesting story even pre auschwitz and he lives this extraordinary life and his um his sort of journey to to kind of escaping is one that is riveting to read even if it's an absolutely horrendous circumstance um, so it's, a, it's an incredible book and I think um, does something very, very clever with the way it approaches sort of a, a, you know, a non-fiction piece about somebody in a very tricky time of history. Next up, we have Constructing a Nervous System by Margot Jefferson. And uh, this book, I think, is also just so exciting with how it approaches nonfiction um, and memoir. So this is a story that sort of ostensibly, ostensibly is about Margot Jefferson herself, and it's her sort of coming to, coming into herself and kind of finding who she is. But it approaches that through essentially a series of major black figures in her life. And so we have people like Etta James, we have people like Josephine Baker, and we we follow sort of how their lives and the ways that they were received in the US and globally and the way that they navigated the world have impacted on Margot herself, not only historically, not only in terms of how they might have changed the world and made it a bit easier for someone like Margot to, to live her life, but also them as these sort of inspirations or these sort of ancestors looking down on her. And so really it kind of reads as this series of mini biographies and I think it's almost quite easy within this book occasionally to realise that Margot is the person we're talking about, that we're coming back to talking about Margot Jefferson and her ability to, to live. But this nervous system, this world that's created around her to help her thrive is sort of based on almost this kind of constellation of these these people from history. Um, and so I thought it was just such an interesting way of approaching your sort of 
history, your sort of biography is sort of thinking about the people who came before you and made this happen or paved the path, but not even just in a sort of way of I'm inspired by them, but here are these four, five, six people and then here's me and now this is how there's a through line between them all. And so at first it doesn't seem like it's going to be connected and it, it makes sense by the end of this book in a really, really fascinating way. It's not really like any kind of memoir I've read before and I, I really appreciated how this book does does that. I think it's also just very readable. It's fascinating to find out about people like Josephine Baker and find out more about her and, you know, Etta James and these other, these other incredible figures uh, from history. And last but not least, we have The Social Distance Between Us by Dara McGarvey. Um, and he is uh, known for his book Poverty Safari, uh, which I keep meaning to read, but which looks at uh, particularly the ways that um, uh, certain areas get left behind and are, you know, left left behind by policies in a way that means that their poverty gets entrenched and the life chances of people within those areas are lessened. Um, and this book in some ways follows some of those same ideas, but takes it to a different level of this idea of social distance. Now, obviously, for in a COVID context, social distance came to mean a very specific thing about how we stayed away from people to minimise the chance of transmission. And he takes this idea and plays with it in terms of what social distance can also look like in society. So, for example, the, the, the ways that there might be parts of your city that you never visit for some reason. And if you're a working class person, it might be because you're priced out of a certain part of town. And actually, there's no point going to that part of town because it either doesn't have things that directly interest you or you can't afford it um, or you're seen as not belonging there. And conversely, the sort of middle class or wealthier parts of a city might never visit another part of the city because it's quote unquote rough or it is um, also not where they belong and, you know, that you don't want to go there. Um, and he, Darren McGarvey talks a lot, for example, about Glasgow, um, which has this sort of history of in the 80s there being um, a real moment, you know, a book, a book like Shuggy Bane is written around that era. Um, Maggie and Me by Damien Barr does a similar thing. Um, and Glasgow in the 80s had this really tricky moment of not only sort of, uh, you know, giant, like really high levels of poverty um, and sometimes bits of violence, uh, but also this kind of community that formed around it and in these certain areas of Glasgow that were seen as rough areas that you didn't go to. And so Darren McGarvey looks at those areas and he thinks about this idea that the people making policy in government often don't know these areas very well. So they don't know, for example, the community and resilience of an area. They only see you know, that part of Glasgow, for example, as a problem that needs to be fixed. And so as a result, that distance really entrenches some of the difficulties that happen with policy, because policy is made by people who haven't gone to that area, who haven't thought about that area much, and see that area as a problem rather than a group of people who are just trying their best. And as a result, policies often make things worse. Um, Darren McGarvey looks at, for example, people who are young offenders or in prison. Darren McGarvey himself did writing uh, lessons and sort of courses in in prisons, creative writing, uh, things that are around rap and various other bits of these workshops with people to really help them express a lot of what was going on. And what he mentions in this book is that the the things that are happening here are often incredibly tricky that these people feel abandoned they feel lost and they feel left behind but actually that's not been changed by this policy this policy has not helped them and a big reason for why it hasn't helped is because there's been this social distance whoever has enacted this has done it from a distance this has been a, a decision potentially made in london in westminster um this has been something so far away from the lived reality of these people um and so I found this a really engaging book in terms of dealing with some really tough issues but also looking at how did we come to this point how have we got a, a thing where a group of people are seen as not only a problem but also a statistical one um where you throw money at it or you put this thing in place or you add more police or you do whatever and that's believed to change the entire outlook of something and so I found it really interesting um, and yeah, I would highly, highly recommend it. And I guess that takes us to the end of this list. We've got five incredible, I think, non-fiction books here 
that all really play with this idea of nonfiction in some way. Some of them are a little bit more sort of standard in some way. So something like the social distance between us feels a bit more essay or journalistic in, in the way it does things. In Love seems at first like a standard memoir. Um, but then they all play with these ideas in, in really fascinating ways. And I think this is a very socially aware uh, shortlist of books as well, um, with some very engaging ideas about society coming out in them as well. Um, so I just really highly recommend the whole list. I think if I have to choose a winner, I'd probably say uh, either const uh, either The Escape Artist or potentially Constructing a Nervous System, just because I think it did something that I've just not seen um, before in a really exciting and interesting way. Um, but yeah, I'd be keen to hear your thoughts if you've read any of them. Um, I do urge you just to check them all out. And I will be doing um, the poetry shortlist soon as well. I just need to finish the last one um, and then I'll be there. But I hope you're all keeping really well. Take care and speak to you all soon.